Hi, my name is Jim. This imposing specimen here is George, and this is our review of Dark Sword Armory's Andride Sword. So, Dark Sword markets this sword as the sword for the lone wolf, the wanderer, the outcast, someone who, for a time at least, is separated from their pack. Now, what I think Dark Sword is trying to say, I might be wrong, uh, is that this is the sword for that guy that you see hanging around the mall, full of menace and sporting a mustache and a t-shirt with an image of a wolf howling at a full moon. Um, I'm just kidding, of course. But if you do like wolves, uh, you will love the sword, whether or not you have a mustache. It has wolf motifs on the guard, as I'll show you soon. Um, and it has engraved text on the blade itself, which reads, One who rides alone in Norse runes, another homage to the lone wolf. Uh, if you too are an individualist or nonconformist and tend to feel more at home with only yourself as company, then this is clearly the sword for you. Wolves were an important animal in Norse mythology. A large wolf named Fenrir kills Odin during Ragnarok. Geri and Freki were Odin's wolf companions, both of their names in Old Norse and Old German meaning greedy or ravenous. Hati Hervitnesen was a wolf that chased the moon across the night sky. First off, I feel compelled to mention that this is the only fantasy sword that I own, at least so far. All of the others that I have are based on historical swords, but I just had to have this one as I too, like our t-shirt wearing friend at the mall, have an affinity for wolves. Plus, and for any enthusiasts of the Witcher series, this sword has a sort of undeniable white wolf feel to it. Uh, though he's shy about it, George here is a huge fan. Another part of that feel is that at 4 pounds 5 ounces, this sword is one of the heaviest in my collection, and so only a true Gerald type would be able to wield this in continuous battle against humans or monsters. Back to the guard. The wolves, along with the Norse-style knotwork, are unbelievably detailed due to the lost wax process that DSA uses for casting, also known as investment casting. With this method, a rubber mold is made from an original piece, a hollow wax model is made from the mold and then covered with a final fireproof mold like clay. The mold is then fired upside down in a kiln and the wax is destroyed or lost as it melts and runs out. Hence the name Lost Wax Process. So as you're going to see from just two of the DSA swords in my collection, incredible detail can be achieved with this method of casting. First I'll show you a close-up of the Andride. And here is the Oslo using the same casting method. Try to hold it still so you can get the detail. So, I'm fairly interested in medieval knotwork, as you may have noticed from the shields I made. DSA's website labels theirs simply as knotwork, but seeing as how the sword has a Norse name in runes, we can assume that the knots are meant to be Norse and not Celtic. Norse and Celtic knotwork look similar, but are different. Though they were born independently from one another, Norse artwork was eventually influenced by Celtic and Christian symbolism starting in the 8th century when the two cultures came into contact, though Norse did maintain its own separate style. Norse knotwork generally has a looser form, whereas Celtic knotwork is both more symmetrical and more dense. Also, Celtic knotwork often portrayed flower or vegetative motifs, while Norse usually depicted animals, people, and even dragons. The incorporation of the wolf is therefore a Norse trait, yet the tightly woven knots across the guard implies a Celtic influence. I'm not sure if that's what DSA intended, but one could surmise that the design, then, is meant to be one 
that was conceived after the two cultures met and of course battled for the lands that the Vikings invaded. That may seem like a lot of info about what some may think of as a minor detail, uh, but it could be meaningful in the broader context of the sword itself, especially if you also tend to mire yourself in details, which I dare say is a trait amongst us lone wolves. of 43 inches with a blade length of 32 inches and a point of balance or POB which is four inches from the guard uh, illustrated in this photo where I'm balancing uh, the sword on the point of balance. That means that even though the sword is a little on the heavy side as I already mentioned it isn't all that difficult to wield and the brass sense stop or pommel complements both the grip and the guard nicely. The blade itself is remarkable. Uh, it has a thick ricasso uh, that ends about three inches above the guard, uh, where it blends into the edges and into a nice single fuller uh, that runs almost the full length of the blade. The basic purpose of a ricasso, or unsharpened part of the blade above the guard, allows the wielder to place their finger or fingers above the guard for greater torque and maneuverability without the risk of being cut. In some cases, the ricassos are large enough to grip completely while the other hand remains on the grip. This allows for better leverage for some techniques used in close quarter combat. The blade is dual tempered from 5160 high carbon steel to a hardness of 60 on the Rockwell scale at the edges and 48 to 50 at the core. Now for those that may be unfamiliar with AISI numbers, the 5 and 5160 means that the major alloy metal is chromium to prevent rust, though only 1% by mass, hence the 1 after the 5. This means that even though the blade is super durable, it will rust and so should be wiped down every now and again with some oil, even if it just hangs on your wall. Now the, uh, the only downside uh, that I found on the sword is, that, is the diamond shaped grip. Uh, it's beautiful, uh, wrapped with leather uh, over the oak handle, uh, whose uh, triangular shape actually complements uh, both the shape of the, of the grip itself and the Norse runes, but the edges do tend to bite into the palm a little. Um, now this can be overcome by wearing gloves or gauntlets, as you should do anyway, so it's really a non-issue. Uh, I only mention it as most people will first hold the sword without gloves um, and maybe put off. Uh, don't be. Wear your gloves or gauntlets, or as gauntlets translates in German, Panzerhandschuhe, which literally means tank gloves and is reason enough to wear them. I mean, how cool of a name is that? Kind of want to put little guns on top of them, little tank guns. Like all of Dark Sword swords, the Eindride is peened, meaning that the tang, or part of the sword's blade that runs through the grip, is hammered over the pommel. As opposed to other methods like threading the tang and pommel, peening is not only historically accurate, it ensures that your grip won't twist as the pommel loosens. When purchasing the sword online, you can opt for a blunt or sharpened blade, and for a scabbard with or without a French tie sword belt. I typically select the scabbard only as most of my swords are displayed on walls, but I do uh, have a few with belts. Um, I have the scabbard that came with the Eindride, though I added a shoulder sling or baldric so it can be worn Witcher style. Uh, now where is that? George, have you seen it? Hey, has anybody seen my baldric? <laughs> oh, never mind. Found it. Poor bust. Now, should you opt for the scabbard with the sword belt, here is an example from another DSA sword, uh, right here. This is from the uh, two-handed Templar sword, I believe. Uh, and it also comes with this pretty cool card that shows you how to tie it. 
Now, due to the forging, tempering, and type of steel, the blade has some serious flex so that it can absorb an impact, yet spring back to its shape, instantly ready for another blow. Now, that's where the Rockwell numbers that I mentioned come in. The 48 to 50 core is softer, which allows the blade to flex and not break, and the 60 edges are harder to retain their sharpness. Now, when I say ready for another blow, I don't necessarily mean that the sword's edge uh, will have been thrust against another's, uh, though it could have been. What I want to counter is the Hollywood notion that all parries are edge to edge. Uh, they are not, or at least they shouldn't be. Though edge to edge, edge to edge parries are effective in certain circumstances, they shouldn't be used often for the simple reason that edge to edge contact damages the sword's edges, obviously. Whenever possible, parry with the flat of your blade here to avoid nicks, or at least come at an angle. Um, yeah, that about wraps up the details of the sword. Uh, let's see how this thing cuts, shall we? The Eindride is my wife's favorite sword, so Eve had the honors of first, if not deepest, cuts. Nice. Nice. Well, folks, that pretty much does it for our review of Dark Swords Eindride. If I could impress only one thing on you about this sword, it would be that it's an almost mythical sword full of personality and woe. Um, it might seem dramatic, but it's a pretty dramatic sword. Uh, it's the kind of sword that could easily be its own character in a fantasy novel or epic movie, much like Excalibur in the King Arthur and Camelot tales. It, it just has this this feel to it that evokes a sense of wonder, uh, like it's touched the supernatural as it's made its way through time and has passed like from king to king, from hero to villain, and then maybe back to the hero again. That, of course, has everything to do with the ruins inscription on the blade, uh, but also because the blades were casso and taper, uh, the feel of the grip, and of course, you know, the weight of the sword itself. Uh, this sword seemingly has its own, own gravity, you know, it just sort of pulls you to it. Um, I'll close with one word of warning. This is Eve's favorite sword, so anyone making the mistake of breaking into our home just may find themselves facing her snarling with wolf sword in hand. Now, she can't grow a mustache, of course, but she has a wolf t-shirt, and she's pretty damn fierce. Break and enter at your own risk. <laughs>